Hello and welcome to On Point. I'm Tatavik Tigranyan. My guest today is Mitch Englander. On June 25th, he will be sworn in as San Fernando Valley District 12 representative. We will discuss politics, budget cuts, tuition raises, and voting among college students. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. What are your top priorities for your district? Well, first and foremost, it's the budget. Um, that's the elephant in the room. The city is looking at roughly a $350 million budget deficit. Uh, so we've got to put things in line. And that starts with prioritizing and creating a priority-based budget. Public safety, we've got to fund public safety. Right now, the city is struggling with closing fire stations and removing ambulance service. That's the core function of local government, is making sure that we have public safety, enough police officers on the streets. Uh, the next thing is public works, paving our streets, trimming our trees, uh, painting out graffiti, and removing dead weeds and weed abatement, all those really exciting things. But those are the things that communities care about, uh, infrastructure, uh, the planning department, and making sure we have enough planners uh, to handle all the needs and update the community plans and the specific plans in the city, and recreation and senior programs. And so if you start looking at the core functions of the city, I rattled off uh, about a half a dozen. <laughs> we have 38 departments in the city, so we really have to get priorities in line and make sure that we do more with less and we do it well. And how do you plan on tackling these issues? Uh, it, you know, it really takes the idea of working with people, building coalitions, making sure that you're communicating with stakeholders. Uh, if you've ever tried to lead a parade by yourself and there's nobody behind you, it's called taking a walk. And so you've got to build coalitions and do outreach. And once you've got support and you've got the political safety net, then you get other colleagues, your council members, to support that as well. Things like priority-based budgeting, things like making sure that we have customer service training in every department, uh, things that the city hasn't done before that we have to do. So how has the San Fernando Valley changed throughout your lifetime? Um, it's gotten tired. It, it hasn't been well maintained in terms of infrastructure and paving streets. I remember when I grew up here in the San Fernando Valley, we always had the rule that you had to go in the house when the street lights came on and kids were riding their bicycles down the street. I remember lemonade stands on every corner. I mean, that's just sort of how I remember growing up here. And I, I think that's changed. We have to bring some of that, some of that back. It's now nostalgic, but I think that's, that's what everybody originally moved here to the San Fernando Valley for. The culture here, the diversity, um, the intellectual property, it's incredible. The people here is what make the San Fernando Valley so great. It's a great place to live, work, and raise a family. So how do you plan on bringing those back? By working with groups. Um, one of the things that's great is, again, the people here. We have one of the most engaged uh, communities in, in the entire city. We have 15 neighborhood councils, certified neighborhood councils. That's more than any council district citywide. There's more service clubs with Rotaries and Kiwanas, and it's reaching out to those people and, and, and making sure that we've got those partnerships and those relationships. We've started doing things uh, years ago, just as a chief of staff, things like movies in the park, where we get neighbors to come out of their home and meet one another. If I could tell you a story real quick, it was one of the things that, um, those career highlights, those things that you never really share with a lot of people, but you remember forever. We had a movie, movie in the park where we had a barbecue and we served food and we put up a big screen in the park in Northridge Park. And I'll never forget the next day, that was a Saturday night, um, Sunday I had to go back to the office and there was a note taped to the door. And we had about a thousand people turn out for that. We had ice cream, uh, root beer floats that we handed out. And the note said, Dear Councilman and Staff, I'm a single mother of three boys. I live across the street from the park and I can't afford to take my kids to the movies in fact. I recently lost my job and I don't know where we're going to live. I don't feel like a mother and I can't provide and I certainly can't afford to take my kids to the movies. And we went to the movies. We went and held hands and walked across the street and sat in the park and watched a movie and we sang all the way home and I haven't had a happy moment like that with my kids in many years. God bless you. Thank you so much. I felt like a parent. When I tucked my kids in that night, I started crying and I said, you know, we're probably going to lose our house and I'm sorry we can't do things like this anymore. And they said, Mom, this was the best night of our life, and this is, it's just that we're all together. And I'll never forget that letter. Mm -hmm. um, that's why you do the things you do. That's why you get involved in public service, to help people, to give back to the community, to get them out of their homes and engaged in the community. And that's what makes this a great place. Okay, what are the important issues facing the San Fernando Valley? Well, going back to the budget, the budget's really the biggest issue right now. Um, because the city cannot provide the services, the core services it should, we have to go back to reprioritize. Uh, what those functions should be. The other thing is we've got in Northridge and Chatsworth the largest industrial base in the San Fernando Valley. 
and a lot of those properties are sitting vacant now. So we have to be competitive, competitive like Texas, where we're going out and bringing new companies here, technology companies. We've lost a lot of aerospace and industry, uh, the movie industry. It's no longer really runaway production. It's now runaway production. So we've got to bring that back. Um, we need a strong job base here so we can have a good quality of life and ensure that we've got the resources and the revenue from that job base to give back to the city to provide the services. So how would you address the city's projected $300 million budget cut? Well, well, first, the first thing is we need a priority-based budget. And so we first go in, and I'd like to redo the budget process, where we start off by analyzing what those core functions are and budgeting those first. The other thing we need to do is eliminate the things we should not be doing. The city, for example, was running a child care center, and they lost $5 million a year on one child care center. That's ridiculous. I was the chairman of the board of the North Valley Family YMCA. We have 14 child care centers, and we're a nonprofit organization, and we don't lose money on any of them. Um, so we've got to create public-private partnerships with nonprofits because that's their core function, whether it's providing meals for seniors, whether it's providing child care centers or recreation programs, um, running places like the zoo or the convention center. We've got to go back to our core function of what people expect of local government. So why do you think budget cuts are necessary? Uh, because the city's grown too big, um, and there's been too many uh, drains on the budget with pensions, pension spiking, all kinds of pension bonuses. And we've got 38,000 employees. Now, the city recently, because of the early retirement program, laid off roughly 4,000 employees. It was a good start, but we're still top-heavy. And I think to get back to those core functions, we've got to streamline local government. And how long do you think these budget cuts will continue? Well, I see on the horizon, and if you talk to a lot of economists, and I'm an optimist, um, that the economy is starting to come back, that we're starting to see at least revenues come back to the city of Los Angeles. So, but I, th I don't think we're out of the woods. I think the economy is going to bump along the bottom for a couple more years before we start seeing those changes. But I'm absolutely opposed to any tax increases, and I, I, I don't think we should borrow our way out of this hole. We've got to be leaner and meaner, provide better services more efficiently and economically. And, and weather the storm. Um, but we have to be proactive to attract businesses here to grow the revenue stream. So do you think furloughs are a good alternative to layoffs? The problem with furloughs, it's not sustainable. It's, it's, um, it's a one-time fix. Uh, there's a lot of problems with furloughs, actually. You've got that, but then you also have an imbalance of work product, where you have some people coming in on some days. You don't know who's around anymore. Um, so you still have those people on the books. You're still paying their salaries and their pensions. They're basically just not getting paid for a day off. It also lowers morale. Um, and it, but it's difficult. It's a really difficult thing to do because when you talk about a layoff, a lot of people, the general public, say, well, the city is too fat and we've got too many people. We should just get rid of them and lay them off. A lot of these are single mothers. A lot of these people are struggling. Um, they're a paycheck away from being homeless oftentimes. And so you've got to think about those things as well. And there's got to be a balance. Okay, so recently Mayor Antonio Villagosa ordered his managers to impose 42 furlough days on city employees. <clears throat> How do you think without working and getting paid that these families can support their children? Well, and that goes back to the problem with, with furloughs. I mean, most of those furloughs that the unions finally negotiated where they won't be taking all those furloughs days, it was a strategic move to build some leverage to get them to contribute more to their pensions and health care costs. Uh, most of the unions stepped up to the plate to actually do that. But that's the problem. Can you fathom, forget the, even the money for a moment, if you were a local company and you had to keep your doors open and still provide the same service to your clients, to your customers, but your employees weren't there 42 days out of the year on top of sick and vacation days, mm -hmm. um, you can't get anything done. And so everything gets backlogged. So furloughs don't work in that regard. Um, and 42 days is outrageous. And it's a one-time fix. Many people believe public safety will be jeopardized if employees such as city prosecutors, jail workers, or even airport security officers take, are put on furloughs. What are your thoughts on that? My priority, my first priority as a council member is public safety, bar none. Mm -hmm. Police officers, firefighters. The Northwest San Fernando Valley is the epicenter of disaster. Uh, if it happens, it happens here from the Northridge earthquake to the Chatsworth train accident to the annual fires we have. And I'm a reserve LAPD officer, so I actually work patrol in the black and white with a uniform and a gun, and I go out there for, for free uh, and work patrol here. But I've been to all those disasters. I was the first responder on many of those, in fact. And I see 
um, the effects of those and what they have on lives. I lost my first house in the fire as well. And the reason that I actually became a reserve officer is that my, uh, my mom lost her job and she was a single mom raising three kids and we couldn't afford our house so we moved in with my uncle and he took me under his wing and he was just a great guy and just incredible entrepreneur really cared about people and he was killed by three young gangbangers as part of their initiation into a gang in Canoga Park and I knew then that I wanted to be a police officer do something with at-risk youth and I've done a lot but I know firsthand from the experiences that I've had that I see as a police officer today that public safety has to be our core function of local government. It's my top priority. Okay, since you mentioned um, the earthquakes, do you have any plans if an earthquake hits? The yes, in, in fact, um, a lot of plans. Um, everybody who's watching this needs to go out and get CERT certified. The fire department offers a free class and first responding training. If we have a major disaster, anything that happened in Japan, anything remotely close, even going back to the Northridge earthquake, here locally, you've got to be able to be independent to feed your family, to have fresh water um, for at least two or three days and be sustainable. Mm -hmm. Most people are, are not prepared, they're underprepared, and they don't know how to prepare. And so we offer that free training. Our council office, in fact, is the only council office in the entire city where every employee is CERT certified. And so we try to spread that gossip and that, that gospel to everybody um, and let them know that they should so show up and sign up and, and learn how to prepare. And how are you informing the citizens who aren't watching this show? Well, one of the things we did last year, for example, is we had an international earthquake conference. It was the largest in U.S. history. where We brought together the best practice areas um, from around the country. And then we joined with the ShakeOut. And we had millions of people in California sign up for the ShakeOut. And we had that the same day. So we're constantly reaching out to people, getting in front of the media, letting them know what they can do to prepare prepare their families, prepare their, their businesses, have evacuation plans, what they need to store on hand in their home, and how they can take care of themselves. Okay, now as you mentioned before, you were Gre Greg Smith's chief of staff. What did your duties entail? Well, as the chief of staff, it's, I think it's the best job in City Hall, <laughs> um, because you can really get involved in the things that you care about. Uh, so as the chief of staff, it was from everything from legislation to media and outreach, working with our communications director, working with um, our field directors and going to community-based organizations and residents and working with businesses and economic development and everything you can possibly fathom. Taking on major initiatives, um, I was a co-author with the councilman on Renew LA, which is a blueprint plan that we wrote. It was historic. We were the first city in the country to do this. So we can end our dependency on landfills because of Sunshine Canyon that's here in Granada Hills. I want to close Sunshine Canyon and find alternatives to landfilling like the other countries have. And as chief of staff, what problems did you encounter with the city? The bureaucracy. It's very difficult to get anything done. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're a resident. It doesn't matter if you're a business. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a nonprofit or a university or a chief of staff. It is extremely difficult to get anything done in the city of Los Angeles. That's why I ran for office, because I want to change that mentality. And how do you plan on changing it? Uh, I want to hold supervisors and general managers accountable with performance reviews and measurable results that can be um, tracked and changed, working with folks like the Rand Institute, J.D. Powers. Uh, they've, in fact, recently created a partnership with the city of Anaheim so they can do customer service training and hold their managers accountable, where they can track workload functions and have reporting back, things like we're doing in LAPD with CompStat. That's what I plan on doing as a council member and trying to turn that paradigm uh, shift around where we can really measure what we're doing as a city and, uh, and, try to, and not have that bureaucratic mentality. We have to boost morale as well. So how did you get involved in politics? Well, <clears throat> I was sort of dragged in and kick, kicking and screaming. Um, it's not something I think that you aspire to. It, it was not so much politics as public service, and there's really a difference. Um, public service is one of the most self-gratifying, rewarding thing you can do. When you're helping people, when you're able to turn people's lives around, when you're helping communities, um, that's extremely rewarding. And because of a lot of the tragedies that I've been through, um, after my uncle died, I knew I wanted to, to do something in public service, and I wanted to become a police officer. So I went through the police academy as a reserve officer, where I worked patrol. But for me, that wasn't enough. So I got involved in the YMCA and got on the board of the YMCA, became chairman of the board, where I was very active, raising a lot of money for expansion plans to help more kids and families that couldn't help themselves. 
but that wasn't enough for me. So I got involved in the Police Activities League Youth Center. And we went out and we raised $3 million from this local community. And right down the street from CSUN, we opened the PAL Center on Wilbur and Parthenia, mm -hmm. where we serviced thousands of at-risk youth. These are kids that we're giving an education to. We have tutoring and mentoring programs, after-school programs. We take them to the snow. Many of them have never seen the snow. We bring them to Sacramento. The important thing is these are kids that won't get on gangs um, or on drugs and that will go to college. Um, that will have an opportunity. And so now we have the state-of-the-art youth center with thousands of people. With all of those things I've been involved in, um, running for office was natural because you have the ability to help so many more people and you have the bully pulpit to do it. Uh, and so it was just a natural following for public service. Now what's the difference between a chief of staff and a city councilman? Big difference. <laughs> As a chief of staff you're appointed um, you, the council member is, at, and you work at the pleasure and the will of the council member. The council member is elected uh, by the people, by the voters of his district. And um, I've had the pleasure of being a chief of staff for one of the best council members, I think, in the entire city of Los Angeles and the history of the city. This is a guy who's just been completely ethical and honest, who's instilled in me about, you know, his principle was just to do the right thing. That's what he lived by. And so working with him for, for eight years, uh, I, I not only learned it, uh, I lived it. And I plan on carrying that through my administration as well. Now, can you explain how the city council works? What are the positions held and the roles people play? Good question. Well, the city of Los Angeles is 465 square miles. It's roughly 4 million people, about 3.8 million people. It's the second largest city in the country. Uh, a lot of people don't know this. They meet more than any legislative body in the country. There are three council meetings a week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. There's 15 committees, each council member, and 15 council members. Each council member chairs a committee, and the committees are from public safety, public works, uh, planning, everything that involves the city of Los Angeles. They all chair a committee, they're a vice chair of another committee, and then they sit on at least a third committee. The committees meet almost every day, all 15 committees throughout the week. And so there's constantly meetings to manage the bureaucracy and the challenges and all the functions of the city. On top of that, there are three proprietary departments. There's LAWA, which is the airports, uh, LAX, and there's the Department of Water and Power, which, in, which is a municipally, municipally owned utility owned by the ratepayers of Los Angeles, and then the harbor. Uh, the harbor, uh, which brings in 42 percent of the goods into this country, the joint harbors of Long Beach and LAX. And so we manage and oversee all of the proprietary departments as well. Okay, so what do you cover during city council meetings and how, how do you decide what goes on the agenda? The agenda is actually set by the council president. Okay. And so everything gets referred first to, you submit a motion. So if you want to create an ordinance, a law, um, a great example is um, one that we recently passed that just went into effect on election day, in fact, March 8th, which was a smoking ban where you can no longer smoke um, in public places at restaurants that, are, that have cafes outside where they serve food. And this would, became a big issue. And so we had to go out there and build a coalition and work with um, places like cigar houses and uh, all different types of restaurants, uh, the California Restaurant Association, hotels. And they were concerned about tourism and, and smoking. And so we had to work with them as well. So we introduced the motion, then that goes to committee. It goes to the planning, that one in fact went to the planning and land use committee. Then we have public hearings on it where people can come testify um, and give different opinions. And that's where really the work is done in committee. It's negotiating the language and what can work, what exceptions there might be to, for example, that rule. Um, what came out of that, for example, was uh, that you can smoke if it's a private club that doesn't allow children and it's after hours and all those kinds of things. So we had cer certain exemptions and carve outs. Once that's done, if, it's ever, if it ever gets out of committee, then it comes to the council floor. Um, then the whole council takes it up for discussion. If they can send it back to committee, they can table it, they can vote on it. They can vote it up or they can vote it down. Once they vote on it, it goes to the mayor for his signature. He can veto it and then the council can then override a mayoral veto um, by a supermajority vote. And so that's sort of the structure, the governance structure of it. Um, I simplified it, but that's <laughs> sort of how something would work. And how do you determine how to vote on a particular issue? You know, I go back to doing the right thing. Try to talk to as many people, have an open mind, mm -hmm. um, listen to both sides. Oftentimes there's more than two sides. 
Um, the one thing that I have seen that every vote you cast, there's, there's typically there's going to be some people that are really happy with it and some people that aren't. So at the end of the day, it's, you have to be able to sleep at night knowing you, you honestly did the ethical thing and, and you take it to heart that you did the best thing for the residents of your district and for the city of Los Angeles. During this year's election, there was no incumbent on the ballot. Can you please explain what that means for people who don't understand Yes, the an incumbent is obviously anybody who's running for re-election. When my boss, Councilman Greg Smith, um, first was elected, the terms were two four-year terms. So you can only serve eight years. And he committed to that. That's what he had in his mind. That was his life plan, uh, if you will, that if had he won the election, he would try to serve uh, both four-year terms. And, and then sometime in that, the voters extended that uh, and added a third term. But he wanted to retire because he wanted to teach. And he'd been with the city for a long time already. He was the chief of staff uh, for his predecessor as well for 24 years. And so he wanted to teach. And his, his wife was also retired already. He wanted to spend time. He's a, he's a family man. <laughs> he became a grandfather recently. Uh, and so he wanted to spend more time with his granddaughter and his wife and, and his son, who just happened to be getting out of the Navy the same time his tenure was up on the council. So he didn't run for re-election, which created an open seat. So what does the city spend most of its money on? About 80% of the discretionary fund goes to police and fire, goes to public safety. Um, that's about 80% of it. The, the total budget uh, is roughly just short of $7 billion, mm -hmm. uh, and about $3.5 billion to $4 billion at the general fund are the, um, is the discretionary accounts, if you will. Then there's a lot of unfunded mandates from housing and senior programs, uh, those kinds of things. And about 90% of the entire budget actually goes to payroll, salary, and benefits, and pensions. So how do you plan on working with your constituents in addressing their concerns? By listening to them. To be a good leader, you have to listen. You have to have an open mind. You have to have dialogue. You have to be accessible. Um, that's how I plan on doing it. I'm really proud of the relationships that I've had over the years. I was humbled that when I ran for office, I had so much support. I had mentioned earlier we have 15 neighborhood councils in our district. I had 16 current and former neighborhood council presidents endorse me, uh, both major newspapers, the LA Times and the Daily News. And it's because of a lot of outreach. Uh, I spend a, a tremendous amount of time talking to people, going to meetings, and listening to them, what they have to say. Everybody has a valuable opinion. We have a new form of governance, and it's still in its infant, in infancy, um, about 10 years with neighborhood councils. But they have their eyes and their ears on what's going on in the community. And so making sure that we've got strong relationships with them is critical. Now, public transportation is an important issue for LA residents. What role do you think public transportation should have in LA? Well, you've got to dissect that for a second. And if you start looking at the San Fernando Valley and some of the initiatives that, that I'm working on, um, I'm really excited that we're opening the new extension of the Orange Line that's going to come all the way to Chatsworth and Woodland Hills and create a closed loop system where you can actually get on the Orange Line um, and go to Woodland Hills and take the Orange Line up and go to the Hollywood Bowl and or go downtown through the subway system. It's really incredible. The problem is if you get off at the Orange Line, if you get off at Chatsworth and you are a student or a professor, you work here at CSUN, there's no easy way to get here. So I'd like to create a shuttle system, a dash system. Uh, I've already started talking to Metrolink and folks in Washington about car carving out some funds and earmarking funds to do that. Uh, we open that next year, and that's very exciting. The other thing with transportation is the condition of our streets. That affects everybody. According to the Texas study, we have one of the highest costs of driving, of maintaining your vehicle here in Los Angeles. It's about $670 a year in maintenance cost. You also have to think about the, depreci the depreciation of your vehicle as you're driving and hitting potholes <clears throat> and having to repair them. So it affects everybody, and it slows traffic down and creates more accidents. So we have to put money into infrastructure and fix the roads and the conditions of the streets. That's the other element of transportation a lot of people don't talk about. Now, I surveyed students here on campus and asked them how many of them participated in the recent or in any city council election, and 80% of them said they never voted because, one, they don't care, or two, they didn't receive enough information about the candidate. So how would you motivate the younger audience to participate in city elections? It's always been a challenge, um, trying to motivate younger audiences to, in, to get engaged in municipal elections. 
uh, one of the things that I did is I reached out to frater fraternities and sororities, um, asked them to come volunteer on the campaign, went and spoke with them, and tried to engage them. Uh, and I think it had a pretty good effect. We had a lot of students come and, and, and work on the campaign and volunteer. I went out to walk precincts with them, mm -hmm. talked about their issues and getting involved. Um, I was involved many years ago with Rock the Vote, and the whole idea of Rock the Vote was to get young voters engaged in local politics, uh, particularly in municipal elections. The problem so much with younger voters not interested is they get, they get very interested in um, presidential, gubernatorial elections, um, top of the ticket elections. But local elections affect us and impact us more than anything every single day. City council elections, supervisorial elections, those are the, the votes that they're making affect us from planning issues and land use issues. So I'd go to them and I'd explain, did you know that your local council member will be voting to expand or close or create ordinances against fraternities and sororities? We have um, community care facility ordinances coming through the city right now that could impact you and close you down. Uh, and, and, and you have to get engaged and have a voice at the table as a student. And a lot of people responded with that, but we have to do more of it. Since you mentioned the presidential elections, 80% out of the 90, 90% 90 out of the 80% said that they did vote during the presidential elections. Why do you think that is? That's my point, because it sounds sexy, it's exciting. Um, they're voting in a new president, particularly if it's not an incumbent. Um, and in this last election, it was very exciting because there was a lot of firsts for them. Also with young people, I find that when they turn 18, they, they can't wait to cast their vote. When they're 19 and 20, they forget. Um, so we have to keep them engaged and um, inspired and to reach out to them. That's absolutely, and, 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 and being one of the youngest members of the city council, uh, I take that to heart. By doing that, and it's not, it can't just be around election season. It has to be year round. And so getting engaged with them, uh, we've created partnerships with fraternities and sororities throughout the year where we'll bring them out to clean up projects, to get involved in the council office, to, to create apprenticeship programs. Um, and I, I, I would hope that more elected officials take the time to do that as well. Who would you like to see be the next mayor of Los Angeles? It's a great question. Um, and I constantly ask residents that very same question. You know, we've got a lot of qualified people running. I think it's still a wide open field. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you so much for being on the show. I'm Tata Viktigranyan, and this is On Point. This is the opportunity where we're really going to look for a leader who can turn the city around as the economy starts growing out of the hole. Um, we need somebody that's ethical, honest, hardworking, cares about local businesses, particularly small and local businesses. And there's a lot of qualified people running. I hope that whoever does prevail, that their heart's in the right place and they're focused and they care about the city and the future and they're going to work as hard as they promise.